Yeah, maybe uh, Downward Dog followed by right. um, the Cat Cow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, do, I think uh, that'll do it for you. <laughs> do nine or ten handstand push-ups. Yeah, there you go. All right, well, that's it, yeah. man. Welcome, welcome to Take Two. This is it. We're in here. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, well yeah, here we are. Two. Here we are. We're already in. Doing another show. Doing another show. Yeah, ready for it. Uh, actually, season finale show. Ooh. Yeah, I know, right? This is episode 10. Or I guess we kind of had two weird shows, kind of one-offs, and then eight more shows, which is what this is. So this is episode 20. So mm-hmm. this is the end of the season. We won't be back for a little bit, but welcome to the show. So yeah, this is uh, Suspicious Minds. I am Burl. And I'm Wade. Man, I tell you what, I'm pretty excited because today we are talking about Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. The Say 19, what? Ni- yeah, no, the 1994 Australian road comedy film that has Guy Pierce, Hugo Weaving, Terrence Stamp. You remember the movie, right? That's what we're talking about today, right? Oh man, I took the wrong notes. What what, what did you do? Oh, uh, I did Sofia Coppola's Priscilla, which uh, just came out. Oh, that makes way more sense than what I did. No, yeah, <laughs> the life and times of uh, Priscilla Beaulieu Presley. Well, yeah, then my notes are going to be a lot different than your notes. No, of course <laughs> you... I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course we did. We did Priscilla. This is we're talking about Priscilla's Sofia Coppola movie. But I almost had him though. It would have been really great if we actually just did an entire thing. It's like, we're doing it about Priscilla. And then they listened. The whole thing was about Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Yeah. And then maybe we both affected Australian accents for all of it. Ooh, Australian yeah. accents like the guy who played Elvis in this ja- film. Jacob Alordi. Jacob yeah. Alordi. See, we'll we'll get go. to him later. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. We will. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited for our final episode that we get to do something that just came out like just a few weeks ago. So we actually kind of held off recording this until we'd both seen it. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like as a show, we've kind of lucked into a kind of modern day glut of Elvis media. I mean, you had your Baz Luhrmann film in 2022. Of course, earlier this year, you had Agent Elvis. You've got Priscilla now. It seems like this is more Elvis content than we would have gotten in the last like 20 years, really. Yeah. Lilo and Stitch. Sure. Whenever I don't that know was. if that fits in. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, obviously, I think Elvis is really kind of having a resurgence with all these movies coming out and biopics and all that stuff. So pretty exciting time. We I think we chose a really good time to start a podcast. Unbeknownst to us, but yes, it really worked out. So a couple of real quick thing. I think that we should make an announcement at the beginning of the show that you and I put together a 2024 Elvis calendar, and it's so good. It's pretty good. I, the thing is, I've only seen the PDF version. I have ordered one, and it should be here in a couple days. But they are available, and we're going to put the link. We have a Shopify account, and we're going to put it in the show notes. So if you click into the show notes, and then Wade, you'll probably put it up on Instagram. Instagram, Facebook, whatever it takes. Maybe I'll start a TikTok account for this. Um, you should. You should really do it. <laughs> you, you and I could but... do one of those dances. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with God a calendar, damn. calendar nobody dances. Wants, nobody wants to see that. Yeah. But what's great about this calendar is that you know, for years, I, I would say more years than not, I usually have like an Elvis calendar in my bathroom or garage or basement right. or where wherever you keep your calendars. Probably not basement. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, in the garage or like on the dashboard of your car, so you know sure, what day it is so when you're driving in. Yeah. Sure. But for years, I mean, not to disparage other Elvis calendars or, you know, what the hell? I'm not here to make friends. Uh, if I have to... <laughs> if I done have and to, done. <laughs> if I have to spend another year with the uh, Wertheimer collection, like those black and white photos. Yeah. Uh, so, so what this has is really great 1970s, like jumpsuit photos it's got trivia it's got quizzes it's got an eight month meatloaf challenge that you can follow along with it's a real fine package and i encourage all of our dozens of listeners to uh, consider buying one for this holiday season yeah all five of you yes and it's fun and educational so keep that in mind excellent so enough of that we might mention it on their way out of the show but kind of moving on let's get to the meat of this like i said we're talking about the new movie, Priscilla, directed by Sofia Coppola. 
Mm -hmm. And the quick synopsis would be that it is based on the Priscilla Presley book, Elvis and Me, that I think came Mm -hmm. out in 85. Is that that movie? Yeah, 85 is correct. Yeah, the book came out in about 85. The movie spans Priscilla and Elvis's relationship from her meeting him in Germany in 59 until just after their divorce, probably, what is that, 73. So, you know, that span of time. So about 14 years. And I'll say, a lot of ups and downs in there. A lot of crazy stuff happening. Start off briefly with a little bit about Sofia Coppola. It's kind of shameful for me to say that I've really only seen this film. I've seen uh, Lost in Translation. And I watched Godfather 3. Does that count? No. I've seen a couple other ones. The Marie Antoinette. Okay. Kind of got a lot of the same feel as this. Like somebody like trapped in a house. That house Mm -hmm. is much bigger though. Sure. But yeah, it's kind of got the same feel. I guess that Lost in Translation has a little bit of the feel of this too, but... It does, it does. Yeah, we can get into that. And also, interesting, this is the first film Sofia Coppola has shot on digital since a film that she made called The Bling Ring, which was a few years ago. Uh, And I would guess shooting on digital for The Bling Ring was kind of more like aesthetics, kind of, you know, like cheap and kind of grainy. Of course, digital filmmaking has come a long way since then, technology-wise. This one being shot on digital and in a shooting schedule of 30 days, which implies to me, like, very low budget. I wouldn't say micro, but close to micro budget. I know what I've read about it is that, yeah, they had kind of a small budget. I know that impacted music rights and getting music rights and stuff for the film, which is why certain things didn't happen. And then also, I think, where they shot at. So... I think they did it all basically in Toronto, like in and around Toronto. Oh, um, once again, Canada comes up again. Canada. Our neighbors to the north. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if Martin Short stopped by the set. He could stop by our set anytime he wants. That's true. Uh, uh, we've got an open and, seat. We might have to borrow a microphone for him. Sure. Or he could bring his own. He's probably got a microphone. Just hang Or me around. and him can go like kind of half and half, like Springsteen and a uh, little Steven. Okay, there you go. Perfect. You yeah. can do like back to back. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Right. Harmonies, harmonize sure. and podcast at the same time. Because we have to have space for our guitars, you know. That's true. Yep. Yeah. The rock and roll salute. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So obviously we're completely derailed already. So that's sure. all right on brand for us. So I guess what we should talk about uh, a little bit is likes and dislikes in the movie. Should we start with that? What do you think? Yeah, we could do that. Let's go for it. So uh, for you, what kind of struck you at the beginning? What did you really like about the movie, either like aesthetically or with the storytelling or anything like that? What, how about for you? Sad confession I have to make at the start of this. I missed the first five minutes. Um, oh, you missed out then? Because that means, to bring up music real quick, that means you missed the Ramon song at the beginning? That's true, because oh, um, yeah. I checked out the track listing after I saw the film to see if I missed anything. And I noticed the Ramones on the soundtrack, and I'm like, well, that wasn't in the film that I saw. So I guess it was front-loaded. A little bit. We made the mistake of seeing this movie on a Saturday night when the normies are out. And I keep weird hours. I'm just like never at movie theaters on the weekends. So struggled to find a place to park and dragged ass in there five minutes late. Uh, I guess I didn't miss that much other than the Ramones song. I think some toenail painting. I think that also happened. Uh, You see, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, it's like a going to a Tarantino movie. Because mm-hmm. I think he does that in all of them, right? Something foot-related. Yeah. Show me your grippers. <laughs> oh, Jesus. All right. So we're talking about likes and... Likes and dislikes. I'll start. This movie left me feeling off-kilter and uneasy. And I'm not saying that's a negative thing at all. I generally like films that do that. Very much in the use of... Uh, here's something that's popular on the internet now. Liminal spaces, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, that's uh, any place that's covered in plastic, right? <laughs> no. Oh, that's laminated spaces. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good Lord. Liminal space is defined as a transitional space, often empty or abandoned, otherwise eerie, melancholy, or surreal. And I'll, I'll give you some examples here, like a 24-hour gas station. It's not a starting point. It's not a destination. It's kind of this transitional space like a train platform at night or a school hallways during summer break you know what i mean yeah burger Um, king bathroom (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, I, uh, <laughs> you, know, place I you don't gotten... want, you're not starting there, you're not ending there, but at some point you're yeah. ending up there for a little bit. You know, I once got busy in a Burger King bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I brought it up. I sure. figured it would bring back good memories. Right. So essentially Graceland is recast as this kind of like gigantic liminal space. I mean, and Priscilla herself is liminal in that, you know, her experience at Graceland, she has n- no roots there. No real comforts of home or family, just always waiting for like a powerful male to show up and like give her life purpose. Right. But until he shows up, she's just walking around the hallways, looking at stuff. You mentioned Lost in Translation. It kind of strikes me as like a spiritual sequel to that. And that right. a uh, privileged woman is just in stasis waiting for a powerful man. And in the meantime, she's just walking around looking at stuff, you know? Right. Yeah, I guess Bill Murray kind of has the, like an Elvis-like quality to him. A little bit. Little yeah, bit. something like that. Yeah, 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 I think what struck me is something similar to it, but what I found was the isolation of it, which I think is similar mm-hmm. to what you're saying. So all these places, all the loneliness of Graceland, and even at one point, she's outside with that dog, the dog Honey that she gets, and D Stanley mm-hmm. drives by and basically proving, I think, what we all kind of know, like you just get the smallest of glimpses of D. Stanley. It's just like, just remarkably like unpleasant woman. Well, if there had been a uh, depiction of D. Stanley on screen before this, I'm not super familiar with it. I mean, I'm not saying that that hasn't happened, but she was, you know, had a few lines in this movie and was like very much like this kind of like specific kind of character in a way mm-hmm. that I don't think she's been on screen yet. This movie casts her as kind of like a um, mouthy drunk. But I know, like, Elvis certainly didn't care for her at all. Sure. And maybe that comes from that. I have to admit, I have not read Elvis and Me. I don't think I read it. Although certain things I remember from it. So I don't know. Maybe I did read it, like, years ago. Yeah. But, uh, and I've just kind of forgotten about it. But, yeah, um, it's been 30 years since I've read it. So it might as well have been, like, I didn't read it. Was it, like, assigned to you in grade school? Is that why you <laughs> read it 30 years ago? It's, like, seventh grade reader kind of thing that's great did you get a punch ticket at pizza hut for reading it you know i don't want to uh you know embarrass you by asking you to really think of how old you were 30 years ago the answer might surprise th- you <laughs> 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 i don't want to think about it i uh, i plead the fifth but I, I think it's kind of the same thing so she's basically just told go inside because you're making a spectacle out of yourself so she's right. like stuck in this house she goes and there's the two women who work in the office she's like shoot away by vernon It's just a lot of her, like, hanging out, television on, in, like, the big living room there, laying on her stomach and doing homework and stuff. And there's no adult supervision. There's just very little interaction with anybody else. And she doesn't even get to go out and, I don't know how much there was to see in Memphis in 1950. Well, I guess it would have been 1962. So I don't know how much there was to go out and see in Memphis in 1962. But she certainly wasn't going to see much of it. It was basically home and school and then even at school probably no friends because you can't have anybody over they make it real specific like vernon is like no one is allowed at the house we don't allow outsiders so don't even bother with that there's a point that you're going to make by that the whole isolation and uh, no guess very much pandemic vibes it's very much pandemic vibes i think if she had learned how to bake bread and she'd bought a peloton you would have not known any if you've been oh shot in 2020 like it was all takes <laughs> takes place in 2020 yeah i got really into starting a youtube channel where she sings sea chanties <laughs> right yeah she right. with a bunch of other people yeah then they right. uh they do a duet like a virtual duet yeah absolutely though i should say if not for the pandemic we probably wouldn't have started this podcast Also true. Yeah, you would never wrangled me. I would have been too busy not learning how to bake bread or Pelotoning. Mm -hmm. I didn't do either one of those things during COVID. I think podcasting is what men of a certain age started doing during the pandemic. I think we're getting a little off course. I think we should go back maybe and talk a little bit about maybe the cast. We're talking about who's playing who here. For Priscilla, we've got an actress by the name of Kaylee Spaney, who I was not familiar with. If you're ready to feel old, she was born in 1998. You already made me feel old earlier, so this just isn't helping. This is just another nail in my coffin. Yeah, I'm just really piling on tonight. 
Yep. She is best known for such films as The Craft Legacy. The, your favorite movie. Which I'm certainly familiar with The Craft. I did not know that there was a like a uh, remake. A legacy? Or, <laughs> like there's a sequel. You, know, you weren't aware of yeah, that. Legacy. legacy, right. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So I guess, you know, more of a reboot, probably in the same universe, but there's that. She's also known for Pacific Rim Uprising, which was one of those giant fighting robots movies, which I didn't see. And it got me thinking like, oh man, young actors these days, it's just sequels, remakes, reboots. And I got to thinking like, what is Priscilla if not another reboot? This is the eighth person to portray Priscilla Presley on screen, if you can believe it. And just recently, too, because the Baz Luhrmann movie, that person would have been seven, whoever that actress was. I don't really remember. Sure, sure. And I'm just going to go on record and say this. I don't think we got into it yet, but what a better film than the Baz Luhrmann film. Absolutely. So much more of what I was looking for in an Elvis movie I got in Priscilla rather than a Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. It's just the weird stories that I don't think I've seen depicted on screen before, like the bulldozer scene. Right. That has never been in a movie. I think uh, the thing that they leave out, we may have talked about this before we started rolling, but no Vernon on the porch. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they started bulldozing it, which I would have sure. loved to have seen. That would have been a great interaction. But Well, you know, maybe it would have made the scene like more comedic than just kind of like, I don't know. What was the mood they were going for with the bulldozer scene in this one? So I think maybe what they're going for is just like the sense of what her life was like. There are these really, really, really quiet moments. And then her life is just completely interrupted by Elvis and his entourage. They come in and then it's all their stuff all the time. And even when Elvis is gone, she has to basically wait there. And I think even says like, keep the home fires burning. Then also be available to answer the phone whenever he calls. So her whole life is doing these things and i think you would also brought this up about her and the dog yeah very interesting like elvis acquires priscilla in the same way that she acquires the dog priscilla is the dog elvis gives her a pet and elvis himself gets a pet the weird part is is that this movie as much as you kind of feel that even in priscilla interviews you never get the sense that she feels like she was kept like that I mean, I think mm-hmm. she, since she got out of it, maybe that's she's kind of forgives all or whatever it is. But here she is. She moves in. She's 16 when she moves in. She has to finish high school. The idea being that when she finishes high school, she's going to get married to Elvis. This is sort mm-hmm. of the agreement. And it takes him years to finally propose. Everything has to happen the way that Elvis wants it to happen. Like nobody pushes him to do anything. And you get the sense of all those things in the, in the movie that she is just in waiting for him to like have sex with him and waiting to just have any experience. All her experiences are things that he enjoys almost for a long time. You know, it's like, Hey, here's a present. It's a gun, which is kind of in a way, kind of a fun scene. Cause you're assuming like, if you're hanging out with Elvis, there's even a scene where he has to wait outside for her graduation and he's surrounded by a bunch of nuns, and all of them are strapped. All of them have right. guns in their waist, stuck into their pants, and hanging mm-hmm. out with a bunch of nuns. It's just insane. And that's just kind of what her life was like, a weird insanity. But even at the beginning of it, she shows up. She's supposed to be there for, what, I think a week. This is before she moves in. It's like a trial thing. Mm-hmm. And he knocks her out for two days straight on right. pills. And then later on, she kind of like graduates to like wanting drugs to stay awake she wants the amphetamines to stay awake while they're in las vegas or what wherever the hell they are so Mm -hmm. she starts wanting the drugs she starts taking them but originally it's him saying this is what you do when we're hanging out we need to go to bed and this is how you go to bed at my house Mm -hmm. kind of thing right you know yeah elvis wants everyone to uh take the same drugs he's taking exactly and I think it goes to, uh, like, Elvis like, didn't really like people being awake. When he went to bed, he wanted somebody in the bedroom with him, but he didn't want them awake. He wanted them asleep mm-hmm. as well. Well, how did you uh, enjoy the performance by Kaylee Spaney? I thought she was great, especially the young Priscilla. The scenes of her at the diner in Germany, like, right at the beginning where they're, like, playing Venus underneath the uh, Frankie Avalon song, which is kind of on the nose. You know, the music yeah, and the yeah. couple points where there's a real a on the nose music happening throughout. 
which is fine. I think that it all kind of works. Yeah, I don't know. Like through each stage, I actually really liked her performance. I mm-hmm. thought it was very good. It's weird because you have to have somebody acting as if there's somebody with nothing to do kind of all day long. Mm-hmm. And that's got to be a right. really hard thing. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm just hanging out. I guess I'm just waiting for Elvis to come back. Like that's kind mm-hmm. of a whole thing. Or it's her in school trying to stay awake in class getting sent home from the first trip and you can just tell she's like cried the entire plane ride. You can just go like right. mascara running down her face. Right. It was like pretty hysterical. Sure, um, sure. And what do you think of her performance? What do you think? Well, it was good. Good. I um, was very impressed by it. Though the way that everybody in this movie underplays everything and everything is very deadpan. But once again, it is like the complete opposite of the Baz Luhrmann film where everybody was like on 10 the whole time. And it got me to thinking like how much of this is performance and how much of it is that phenomenon known as the Kuleshoff effect, if you're familiar. Uh, the Cool It Now effect? The uh, <laughs> new edition? Is that the, uh, from new edition it, that there's some? It, it was the uh, Coolio effect. Oh, um, the Coolio effect. Okay. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. May he rest in peace. No, uh, the Kuleshov effect, it's a Russian editing experiment from about 100 years ago now, where it was determined that viewers derive more meaning from the interaction of two sequential shots rather than just seeing a single shot in isolation. They proved this by taking an actor and asked him to look into the camera as blankly as possible. And then they would show this footage to people and they would intercut it with something like a hot bowl of soup or something. And a viewer would be like, oh, this is incredible acting because you can see the hunger in his eyes, how much he wants that soup. Or they would also have a version that they would show people where it's like the actor and then cut to like a child in a coffin. And it's like, oh, the sorrow, it like emanates from this performance and all this. And just how audiences through sequential shots assign our own meaning to it. So I'm watching this film and I'm like, is is that what I'm seeing in this film? Am I like getting more meaning from just the editing than I am from like what anybody's actually doing in this film? Whatever. It it was a fine performance nonetheless, but just, just worth noting, I guess. What's weird is I do a similar thing when I'm editing this. I do uh, the psychoacoustics trick where Mm -hmm. you play sounds underneath. So what I do is we have us, which you can Mm -hmm. hear, which you can't hear. So I actually have audio of a croque madame throughout the entire thing. And it makes you feel this hunger to listen to more Mm -hmm. of the show. So that's what I do. <laughs> you're, you're a very believe strange it, person. Bro. Believe it or not, would you believe <laughs> that third track you're hearing is actually a crook madame? <laughs> just uh, subliminally. Yeah, just um, subliminally hearing it. Just that uh, the perfect egg on top of it. Here's the thing. I think it's worked so far. So I'm just yeah. running with what's working. Well, I know I've gained a few pounds since the show started, so... Yeah, I was going to mention that, but uh, right. that's okay. It's all right. You know, we're all working on it. So I was going to say, so we talked about Kaylee Spaney. What did you think about Jacob Elordi? Good. Uh, yet another actor I'm unfamiliar with. Um, I understand he's Australian. He's Australian. Uh, he's a hunky Australian. And he, he's in the uh, Euphoria. That's the HBO. Is it now Max? Does it matter? It, he's Yeah, it's a, it's a series that they have mm-hmm. there. And pretty good. And once again, you know, in the theme of this film, like everybody underplaying it and being a sort of deadpan, I think this kind of like underplayed swagger works for me more as the Elvis character than the Austin Butler approach, which was very emotive and on 10 the whole time. Yeah, really flashy. I think what he really nailed was the sense you got of like that early 1950s Elvis where he's like, constantly got his hand on his face and sort of mumbling all the Mm -hmm. time. Like he really, really nailed that. I also think they have numerous scenes that I swear they probably had to have done all of them the same day. Whereas like there's the bus outside of Graceland Mm -hmm. and all the guys are going to get on and they're leaving again. And it's like, they probably like six different outfits. He's got to like get into it. So, okay, we're going to go do this movie. Okay. We're going to do this movie. And just as like, Hey, you just stay here. 
just real kind of mopey using all of his nicknames for her and all this stuff and just kind of goes on and on and on and it was like yeah this is probably a lot like what elvis would have been like kind of like a little sheepish in a way Mm -hmm. but also cleverly sheepish like he's kind of Mm -hmm. pretending to be that way and then getting you to sort of oh no it's okay elvis don't worry about it oh you're you're so embarrassed about this or oh you're so worried about this no need to worry well it's like cool and calm draws you in exactly and too much effort repels people. So I think that's what was happening here with this performance. Uh, just a side note, do you think it would be harder or easier for an Australian to do a Memphis accent? It depends, I think. So you're saying like someone from the U.S. or if someone was English? I think like for a native English speaker, and you're saying just sort of a non-regional Midwest, I guess, sort of accent other than Australian So here's the thing. I think that in a way it would be easier for the non-regional kind of Midwesterner to do it just because they've probably heard that sort of accent before. So it'd be a little bit easier to do it. Like I think coming to it from nowhere, I don't know, maybe Uh, that's probably what I would go with because you've heard that Southern accent. So you probably come with like a a generic Southern accent, which probably isn't quite right. Just, you know, being that, like, I've always grown up really just a few hours from Memphis. I mean, Central Illinois, like St. Louis, Missouri, I mean, with what, it's like four hours from here, maybe less. Uh, Yeah, sure, as the crow flies, sure. So, like, I've always been relatively close to Memphis. I, I wouldn't say routinely hear people speak like this, but, you know, it's not uncommon. Whereas someone who's from, like, Australia, I mean, they would have never really encountered this accent, like, naturally. So it seems almost like they would have, to me, I think somebody who's like from like my area of the country, it would be too easy to slip into like a a caricature of it. Sure. But if you're like coming to it fresh and learning it as like some sort of new thing that you weren't aware of, might be easier to do. I don't know. I think the bigger question is, would it be easier for a non-US person who probably is less familiar with Elvis to do an mm-hmm. Elvis impersonation. And I think that would probably be easier because everybody would just do the thank you very much Elvis. And everybody's kind of heard that a million times. And it doesn't really sound like him when most people mm-hmm. do it. Like most people right. are really bad at it. But sure. he nails it. I'm not going to say he sounds exactly like Elvis, but it's definitely like more than passable. It's a really, he does a really good job with it. So kudos to him and the other thing is he looks incredibly tall i don't know how tall he is i didn't look it up but mm-hmm. i would say over six feet and then she kaylee looks like she's about five foot nothing so the height disparity between them i think kind of even adds to like how he kind of has his power over her. the height difference is like so noticeable in a lot of right. scenes yeah which one would think that you wouldn't cast like such a beanpole like this Jacob Elordi as Elvis. Because, you know, Elvis was, you know, normally proportioned like six foot tall, six foot one. This guy being kind of like very lanky and kind of angular. And you would think that that wouldn't work for it. But in using his size towering over like the actress playing Priscilla. Yeah, definitely very much like kind of underlines what this movie's about. This dominance. I, I will say it's always tough I think for actors to pull off like the 50s Elvis, you know, as far as appearance goes. Sure. Unless your name is Michael St. Gerard, which, you know, he was able to pull it off. And then, of course, as you depict like later eras in Elvis, like your, you know, like late 60s, 70s, then it gets to be about, you know, the haircut and the sideburns and the sunglasses. And you can make anyone look like Elvis, basically, if you're shooting for like 1972 Elvis. But I think this movie did a very interesting thing in that when it's the 50s, he's usually shot like in shadow, often in silhouette, or he's got like his hand over his face right? You know, when he's talking. So it's not as like glaringly like out of place as it normally would be, I think. I, I, I thought that was like a very um, clever way of handling the fact that he doesn't really look like Elvis that much. Well, and the thing is, who are you going to get that looks like Elvis? You know, I mean, yeah, nobody looks like that guy. I think the closest you're ever going to get, Michael Mm -hmm. St. Gerard. Yeah. That's about it. We had our guy, and those those days are done. Once again, wish they would have cast him as Vernon, but can't make all that stuff happen, so. Sure. Yeah, it's a damn shame. 
And Michael St. Gerard, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, uh, if you'd ever like to come on the show and talk about your experiences uh, playing young Elvis, we'd love to hear. Just in general, I liked the movie a lot. I thought this was very worthwhile in the Elvis biography canon. This is exactly what I was looking for in an Elvis movie. I absolutely agree. And the crazy thing is, it's technically not an Elvis movie. It's a movie sure. about Priscilla. He's a co-star in it, which is, in a way, it kind of works better because in her life, he was always the star. And it's like, then finally, in her own story, she gets to be the main character. But mm-hmm. it's still like, he interrupts so much her, of her life. You know, there's even mm-hmm. a scene where, like, she's in the bedroom trying to get schoolwork done. She has to go close the door to the bedroom just to, like, keep the noise out because it's just so right. loud. It's so definitely loud. And that's the other thing, you know, we're talking about all the spaces in there. And, like, we spend a lot of time in the bedroom where, like, they're mm-hmm. just delivering food and then the empty trays are set outside they're in there and it's pillow fights and there are a lot of Polaroid photos mm-hmm. being taken, which I think kind of alludes to how they're doing just everything but having sex, basically, mm-hmm. which that's what right. Priscilla has always maintained is she did not have sex until their wedding day, which, man, that's a long haul, man. That's all I'm yeah. going to say. It is. <laughs> you know, it's it is. a long haul. Because I'm going I'm to tell you this, Elvis really didn't have any issues. He did go out to... California got on a movie set. It was, I'm pretty sure, fair game for everything. But yeah, she was dance classes, I guess. I don't know. Working out of frustrations. Anyway. Like Lamar taking her out shopping. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think that would really take the wind out of anybody's sails. Just spend, a, spend, sure. a, spend an afternoon with Lamar. No, I agree. I think this is after the Baz Luhrmann movie. And I think we even said no movies are coming our way about Elvis for a long time. And... Mm. This one came along, and it's just better in every way. And I think there's reasons for that. In a way, there's a thing, I guess we can get talking about the music here in a minute, but there's really no Elvis music in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. Which, to you, I don't, you get the feeling that in a way, it just humanizes him more, because you kind of take away this celebrity, you take away this thing that he's so well known for. Because at some point, I think you forgive a lot of his foibles and the fact that he's like, you know, the obviously show him as being a little capricious. There's a scene where he like throws the chair and does some stuff. Mm-hmm. He gets like really angry during a pillow fight. He does some other stuff, like wants to separate from her while she's pregnant. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, obviously they've only been married months, seven, eight months at that point. And he wants to be separated from her. So there's all these things and very quick to apologize, but still wants to put up with that stuff but in a way i feel like if you do that and then you're playing suspicious minds under it or something like that you're like yeah but that song's really good (laughs) you know (laughs) you know what i mean man i i I totally remember like this tune and burning love is great like you just get lost in the fact that you really like the music so i feel like in a way we get talking about the music i know that they really can get the rights to a lot of his music i know they had a low Mm -hmm. budget but Do you think a lot of that has to do with Lisa Marie not liking the script? Absolutely. Although I don't think the movie makes Elvis look as bad as they could make it. Oh, yeah, absolutely Make him look, absolutely. But still, I would understand, you know, like Elvis Presley Enterprises being like, yeah, we don't really want to, like, associate with the essential creepiness of the story and the kind of downbeat melancholy. It definitely seems like, you know, something they wouldn't want to be associated with. I actually had that, the fact that there's no Elvis movie in my notes, the fact that there were no Elvis songs as being like a negative about the film. But no, I think what you're saying is very astute. Um, You know, it's like... It was bound to happen after 20 episodes. I was going to say something. (laughs) (laughs) You know, even a broken clock. (laughs) Right, yeah, right. I'll put that uh, feather in my cap. But also, stuff I didn't like about the movie, um, very near and dear to our heart. Once again, the Memphis Mafia depicted on screen is like just yet another leering mob, you know? Yeah, it's too bad. Like I said, I think you and I, we need to write the movie Sunny and Red from their perspective. I think it'd be sure. a good movie. Or just the Charlie Hodge story. Let's never write that one. Let's <laughs> no. never, it's just like Waters and Scarves. Like right. Maybe that's what we'll call it, the Charlie Hodge story. 
But just depicting like the Memphis Mafia as a bunch of like hooting yahoos. That is Priscilla's truth. That's how she experienced it. So yeah. I, I'm just lamenting just though how many great Memphis Mafia stories still to this day remain untold. Yeah, it's too bad. I think you could almost do like a talking head movie about them or like a documentary where it's just them they're doing that and then just reenactments of it. Mm -hmm. I would watch that movie. No, that's your Netflix animated series, The Memphis Mafia, in which Elvis appears like every third episode for like two minutes. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed it. It's like the rest of the time they're like, you know, trying to get stuff done, like go pick up his dry cleaning and, you know, screw it up somehow. And, you know, it's like hilarious events ensue. The one thing is, is like you were just saying, I think we're just talking about Lisa Marie not caring for this at all. Mm -hmm. I don't have the letter in front of me, but it's just like you are desecrating my father's image, basically. Mm -hmm. right. And what's weird is it's based on a book her mother wrote. We're just taking facts from that and putting it into a, a script. So talk to your mom. Why are you yelling at me about this? And in a right. way, this movie has made me kind of rethink, and not that I want to watch it again, and you kind of talked about the Netflix, maybe Priscilla's kind of got it together a little bit. You know, it's, mm -hmm. even though some, not nothing's 100% perfect, but Agent Elvis, I mean, at least mm -hmm. she's trying to do stuff. And yeah, I understand why Lisa Marie wouldn't like it because it has the drugs and the violence and all this stuff going on in it. But I think that stuff kind of happened though. You know, mm -hmm. and we're working it in and we're making it fun, doing this and that. Like I said, I don't love the show. I think it's kind of a mess. It needs some help. But this movie seems like it kind of figured it all that stuff out. You know, how to mm -hmm. present all these facts, make a really easy to watch movie. You know, and uh, it's one of those things that I think even down the road, like watching at home, it's going to translate there. Where it's like Baz Luhrmann. I think we talked about a little bit of this before we started rolling. How the Baz Luhrmann movie, it's like, it, it is a big screen thing. And this doesn't have to be. It's a story that's small. It's almost like claustrophobic, right? Mm -hmm. It's like being on house arrest, mm -hmm. you know, almost. And it kind of gives you that feeling, you know, it's like being stuck at home for COVID. Like everybody can kind of relate to it a little bit. So I don't know. So I, it works in a way that it, that doesn't. It could very much be enjoyed on your iPad, in your bedroom, right before you like go to sleep. Exactly. Headphones in. And another plus, no Colonel Tom. He's just a guy talking on the other end of a phone occasionally. And I don't think you ever hear his voice or anything. Well, you know, it's once again like Priscilla's truth. I mean, it's just how much did she ever have to deal with the Colonel? All right. Yeah, probably very little. I would imagine, or she probably just thought he was kind of a creep, to be completely yeah. honest. So just didn't write a bunch about him because I like, didn't really think much of him. But I think there are very few dislikes about the movie. I really do dig it. Should we talk about the music a little bit? It was, you know, a lot of anachronistic songs, which, as sure. I understand, Sofia Coppola Hallmark, yeah. especially, you know, in the case of Marie Antoinette. Incidental music by the French rock band Phoenix. Mm-hmm whose uh, lead singer, Thomas Mars, just happens to be married to Sofia Coppola. So right. there's a connection that makes sense. Uh, what, do, what do you think about The Phoenix as a rock band? You know, I, I haven't listened to a bunch of them, but personally, I, I like me some French rock and roll. So I had no issues with French rock and roll. And, and the, yeah, they do some really good work for the incidental music. Also, I, I think that they did a great job picking out music for this, even when it's mm -hmm. not period correct. The beginning of it, where it starts off with the Alice Coltrane uh, going mm -hmm. home, and then it goes into the Ramones. I mean, it all kind of just works. You know, it, it just mm -hmm. it feels right. It's like it has the right emotional tone, even sure. though it might be off here or there a little bit by a few years. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I know a lot of Frankie Avalon, Venus plays in a couple different places in there. But, you know, mm -hmm. really at the beginning, when you first meet Priscilla in the movie, it's right at the beginning. Certainly works. And then there's a Burt Bacharach song. I don't know who does it, but I think it's Wishing and Hoping is playing in there. Okay, yeah. And that has, you know, the, the very antiquated, wear your hair just for him, do the things he wants to do, kind of sentiment to it. It's right. like, wow. But that plays at some point when the whole gang comes back to Memphis. She's coming down the stairs. I mean, there's some real on the nose stuff, but it really works. Even at the end, when they have Dolly Parton, you know. Oh sure. Yeah, I will. The, uh, you. 
Yeah, yeah, a, li- a little on the nose, but it was the right song for the scene. Earlier in the film, you know, it was still in the 50s, he had a Crimson and Clover playing, a little out of um, the timeline, a little Tommy James and the Shondells. It was a great song cue for the scene. I don't know, I was into it. It's very much like a uh, Gen X hipster curated sort of stuff. Kind of surprised a Kiss song didn't make it in there. Oh, yeah, and credits said Hard Luck Woman. Did you not stick around? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was right at the end. You didn't hear that? Hard luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I uh, had to go uh, pay the babysitter. So. Oh, right. Well, yeah, if you'd stuck around, you would have heard a hard luck woman. Sure. Next time you'll know. Right. Like that. It was a post credits uh, performance. Where she walks back on, she's like, You're still here? Like, mm-hmm. I got out. You got to get out. <laughs> right. And then she opens up the gates of Graceland and then you leave. Like, that's the right. end credits. Yeah, it's real Ferris Bueller kind of thing. That <laughs> oh, you don't remember that? You don't remember that? Yeah, oh, my yeah. God. Well, I left early from that one, too. There you go. Right. I, I, you, you didn't I, even I, go to that one. You don't even like... Yeah, uh, I already spent enough time with Matthew Broderick. He knows what he did. That's right. He knows. Right. Yeah, he knows. he knows. Speaking of Kiss songs, if you were to pick a Kiss song to go into this movie, what would you pick? Any kiss song, whatever you want. Yes, it's up to you. I have an answer for this. We haven't talked about this yet, but there's a scene where uh, Elvis and Priscilla trip acid, which is, I think, the first time I've seen in an Elvis biopic. For that scene, I would use from the Ace Frehley solo album, Fractured Mirror. It's like an instrumental. Ooh, nice. Very yeah. nice. I might go with the beginning, like the really, really long intro from Rock Bottom, Dressed to Kill. Sure. <laughs> like that acoustic <laughs> intro. Or maybe even a little bit later, maybe over the end credits, sure know something from Dynasty. Uh, you see, I think that would be great. That would be poignant. I think so, because it's kind of got some of the themes. Yeah, I think especially like right after Dolly Parton plays, then you go right into that. Sure. Get Sofia Coppola on the phone. Let's recut this sucker. Sure. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. You know, special home video version. Or right. um, how about during the um, bumper car scene? They play uh, the love theme from Kiss from Ooh, the first album. Man, the instrument great. Yeah, also known as Acrobat. Yeah, yeah. actually, anyway, with that anyway, you can almost deep cuts. Well, you must do like Parasite or something because it's got those crashes in there. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we're just getting fucking stupid. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we really lost it. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Stick, stick around for our Kiss Cast coming next season. That's through our Patreon. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, Maybe Patreon maybe. exclusives get early access to the Kiss Cast. That's right. First episode, we're covering the album "Hot in the Shade" from 1990. <laughs> <laughs> Unmasked. Well, I think that kind of covers the movie. Like I said, I think we're both giving it Red Wests. Is that how we were doing it again? Are we? Uh, yeah. Or like, uh, yeah, I'll give it a Red West. And half a Diamond Joe. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Yeah, I'll give it uh, give it three Diamond Joes and a Red West. It's really good. Definitely worth checking out. So, you know, get out there and watch that movie. It's Wade and Burl approved. Which is maybe the first film we've reviewed on this podcast that we both, like, unanimously like. Except for uh, Viva Las Vegas. Maybe Living Legend. The uh, It was Living Legend of the King of Rock and Roll, right? The Earl Owens. I think we both like that. Actually, now that I think about it, we've liked all the movies. <laughs> yeah, but most of the movies, we just really didn't care for the Netflix series all that much. No, we didn't. Heartbreak Hotel, we had nice things to say about it. You know, me and Charlie Schlatter are Facebook friends now for some reason. He's not a friend yeah. of mine. He's no friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta I, I, keep very... it, I gotta keep it professional, you know? You see, I had nice things to say about his portrayal of Ferris Bueller, so, you know. There you go. Well, I think that takes us into uh, a couple of segments we like to do. But before we get into that, I think we should talk about this show's sponsor, this week's sponsor, which is Gene Cream by Duke Lamar. Have you lost the magic in your pants? Do your dungarees droop and sag? Try Gene Cream by Duke Lamar. Our proprietary blend of botanicals and pharmaceutical-grade petroleum will restore the color, stretch, and luster to even the oldest and most worn out trousers. Let them know you're happy to see them with Gene Cream by Duke Lamar. There you go. I, wow. uh, I'm buying some tomorrow. Yeah, that Duke Lamar sounds like a heck of a guy. I hope yeah, we meet him someday. Me too. Me too. I hope that that somehow works its way back into this show, that Duke Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> spoiler alerts. <laughs> I guess we should have said that there were a bunch of spoiler alerts on this show, but whatever. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you know, who the hell cares? So tonight's Wadeback Machine goes all the way back to May 1st, 1967, the date of Elvis and Priscilla's wedding. Did you know that wedding took place in the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever see that movie, Aladdin? Nope, never seen it. But that's the one oh, the yeah. Disney movie with the blue man? With the yeah, scary with the blue, blue man. man. <laughs> yeah, scared, remember the blue... so scary. <laughs> yeah, he's scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The number one song as of May 1st, 1967, Something Stupid by Frank and Nancy Sinatra, if Ooh. you can believe it. So it, Priscilla's walking down the aisles, and the number one song in the country is um, Someone Else that Elvis Banged. Exactly. <laughs> God. <laughs> and if you... <laughs> nice way of putting it. Yeah. Right. It was uh, Nancy, not Frank, of course. Though, you know, who knows? Yep, you never know, man. It was yeah, the swing in the 60s. A lot of things right. happened. Yep. Yeah, people kept their mouths shut back then. The number two song of May 1st, 67. A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You by The Monkees. It's uh, one of those Neil Diamond penned songs. Oh, man, that's a good one. Man, he did. Yeah. Some, man, he wrote some good tunes for them. Um, I, I prefer my Neil Diamond is filtered through the sensibilities of the monkeys. I don't know. He's got some tunes on his own that I really like. Yeah. I also like Carol King. She wrote some songs. Yeah. A lot yeah, of those brill true. building people. Sure. Porpoise song. Sure. You know, do yourself uh, a favor, excellent. listen to that. Yeah, listen to that one. Yeah, the head soundtrack in general. If Neil Diamond had given the monkeys a Sweet Caroline, who would have sung it? Oh, I'm thinking that's Davy Jones right there. You think that's a Davy Jones? Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I, I could also see Mickey Dolan's handling that pretty well, too. Either one of them. I mean, they, they're they both very good. Mike Nesmith being, of course, my favorite of the monkeys. I've uh, I've sure. never made any bones about that. I like him the most. But sure. Not a strong vocalist, though. Not the best of the vocals, but definitely my favorite. And just wrote some really good tunes. So. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, check out um, the uh, Not Your Standard Ranch Stash if you have not checked out that album. Very good. Yeah, the monkeys. You know, we're not even like joking around here. Like real powerhouses put together kind of slapdash for a TV show, but their enduring legacy, you know, speaks for itself. That's <laughs> a lot about the monkeys. The third biggest song was Happy Together by the Turtles. You know, another one of those all-time classics. Absolutely. Man, 67 had it going on. Yeah, really coming through for us. The fourth song, uh, Sweet Soul Music by Arthur Connolly, or Conley, I should say. That's that one where it's like name-checking like James Brown and Lou Rawls and stuff, you know? Yeah, the Do You Like Good Music? Yeah, yeah. That right, song. right, yeah, right. Yeah. Sweet Soul uh, Music. Yeah. Which, that song is only minorly ridiculous. You know, it's a good one. Yeah, I like it when they do that, though. I like it when... Yeah. Um, I mean, what are some other ones that do that? Does, does American Pie count as one of those? Mm, they don't Probably really not. call anybody by name in that. Um, yeah, th- the that. nearest I can think of is any of those songs that like name check a bunch of cities. You know, like yeah. uh, that Huey Lewis uh, Harder Rock and Roll song. It's like the Chuck Berry song that names it. It's, uh, Elvis says it, uh, Promised Land, that song. Mm-hmm. It talks a right. lot about cities and stuff, which is kind of cool. So yeah, there's yeah. one. There's another one. Because, yeah. you know, you're always like, uh, there's a possibility you're listening to that song. It's like, hey, you just said my city. Hey, I've been there. Yeah. Or in the case of Sweet Soul Music, like Lou Rawls was like, did he just say my name? Like, <laughs> right. <what?" laughs> yeah. Like, keep my like, name out of your I mouth. Do? do I get 5% of this song now? Okay. Uh, number five hit song of May 1st, 1967. I think we're alone now by Tommy James and the Shondells coming up again. And I like to point out this top five list very much describes the marriage of Elvis and Priscilla. It's definitely something stupid. It's a little bit me, a little bit you. They're happy together, at least today they are. Sweet soul music, that doesn't fit. And I think we're alone now, because, you know, they finally get to uh, bang it out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. After a long 10-year wait or whatever it was, yeah. Right, yeah, jeez. The one time. Um, right. May 1st, 1967, also kind of generally considered the beginning of the summer of love. Well, I guess depending on where you are in the country. Depending on if you're married Elvis or not. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, May 1st, though, you know, still pretty cold in some parts of the country. Like, probably not the summer in Milwaukee yet, I would guess. Yeah, frostbite falls. Whatever. In Memphis, definitely. May 1st in Memphis, I'm sure it's like 81 degrees at yeah. like 9 in the morning. Yeah, you spend all day at the movie theater just trying to cool right. off. 
Number one movie of May 1st, 1967, uh, A Man for All Seasons. Charles Heston, is he in that? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. That sounds I know, great. it's a Thomas More. It's Henry VIII, right? All that. Right, right. Yeah. I watched the trailer and I read a synopsis and I still have like no idea what this movie's about. Okay. It's all about the Church of England and all that stuff, leaving the Catholic sure. Church. We'll talk after. I'll, ex- I'll explain sure. the history of it later. <laughs> <laughs> it's grown folks' movies, though. Yeah, you know? right, it's yeah, like yeah. it's not like the number one movie. You know, back then it was like Ant Man three. Right. Know? Yeah. It's yeah. like actually a movie about something. Anyway, number one TV show Bonanza. Pretty good Ooh, one there. The westerns, man, real big. I would have said Rawhide sure. or something like that if you would ask. Mm, Probably, I think which uh, is fine. I'm glad you did. Sixty seven's a little late for Rawhide. You know, Bonanza. You know, it's in color. Yeah. Lauren Green is on that. Lauren, Lauren Green. Green, yeah. Michael Mike Landon. Landon, Michael Landon, yeah. yeah. I like that show. It's a good. Yeah, show. it's good. It's very good. Second hit show of that day was uh, the Red Skelton Hour, which I presume is like you know variety show, sketch comedy sort of a thing. Uh, I'm assuming too. I can only assume with you. I only know Red Skelton from uh, Poseidon Adventure, so you know I know, I know he was like a comedian and whatnot. So yeah. Anyway. Third biggest show, the Andy Griffith Show. Okay. Which I should say is not the same thing as Andy Griffith. So Ron Howard had moved on. Right. Don Knotts had moved on. But have we moved on from Don Knotts? In our hearts, never. Never. Never yeah. will I move on from Don Knotts. What would be uh, funny is if Norman Fell replaced him on the Andy Griffith Show. <laughs> <laughs> like a real twist, yeah. Well, that's just the thing. It's like, man, I loved Mr. Furley on mm-hmm. F3's Company, obviously. But I also love Mr. Roper. So, fourth biggest show, The Lucy Show, which is not, not, I, I, love Lucy. not yeah. I Love Lucy. <laughs> no. But uh, Lucy Ball's project in the late 60s, which I've never seen a single episode of. <laughs> and the fifth biggest show, The Jackie Gleason Show. All right, there we go. Mr. I love ice cream on my pot roast. Getting drunk with Nixon, learning about aliens, ass. Should we eat like Jackie Gleason for a day for a thing, just for fun? The idea of ice cream on pot roast. It grossed me out too much. Yeah, and it would probably involve a lot of booze and like probably cigars. And like, I don't know, my lifestyle just doesn't jive with that right now. The booze I think I could hang out with a little bit. That'd be kind of fun. But like, drink a bunch a of Jackie stash. Gleason's amount of booze in a day. Oh, no, I'd be dead. Right. Okay. But uh, once again, uh, I don't know anything about what the Jackie Gleason show would have been like in 67. I wonder if he was like, you know, doing his music because he's put out like tons of albums. Yeah, I don't know, man. I can tell you. I don't yeah, know. I've, I've never watched the show. And that's it for the Wade back machine. That's all I got. <laughs> Thunderous applause. All right. right. <laughs> well, that brings us then to your favorite segment. Uh oh. Which is Would You Believe? Oh, Jesus. Okay. Which, go. going back to the beginning of the show, I accidentally wrote these all about Priscilla, Queen of the Dust. If off the top of your head you could lie five times about other topics, that'd be great. <laughs> off the top of my hand. So, Would You Believe? that when they were casting Priscilla, Queen of the Deserts, I'm going to do one for you. The part of Bernadette, played by Terrence Stamp, a, a fan favorite. I know we both like us some Terrence Stamp. Right. Initially, the producers wanted to cast Tim Curry in the role of Bernadette. Would you believe? I'm going to say I don't believe it because Terrence Stamp is nobody's second choice. That is incorrect. That is true. 100% true. Ah, oh, damn. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. So now Who let's knew? moving on to actual things. I had to throw one of those in just because I made sure. a joke earlier. So would you believe this is getting back to Priscilla and Elvis, but one night they're hanging out. You know, Elvis liked to watch a lot of movies. They're hanging out, screening a movie, and it's a scary movie. And afterwards, Elvis turns to Priscilla and he's like, do you want to see something really scary? So they get in a car. He drives them, takes them to the morgue. And then Elvis mm. like persuades them that he can go in and he needs to see some bodies. So he takes Priscilla in and they go and look at dead bodies. Would you believe? Yes, yes, I am going to believe that. That's a story in uh, Elvis What Happened. It is true. That is 100% true. They did it after watching the movie uh, Diabolic or Diabolique or however you say it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently like prayed over like an infant and stuff, which is really creepy. So creepy. 
This one's a bit of a two-parter, but here we go. So would you believe, so Elvis, he buys mm -hmm. Priscilla that, in the movie, you see it in the movie, the poodle named Honey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then Priscilla returns the favor by buying a beagle for Elvis that was named Sapphire. Would you believe? I would believe that. They had a ton of animals in that house. No, I made that up. That's false. <sighs> uh, but he did own numerous dogs including a chow named Get Low and a collie named Baba. Now, hmm. would you believe one of those dogs made an appearance alongside Elvis in a movie? Would you believe? Yes, I would, because why not? That's absolutely true. Uh, the collie Baba appeared in... Now I get that joke. Collie Baba. Got it. So yes, the collie appeared in Paradise Hawaiian style, your favorite Elvis movie. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> poor dog. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, poor right. thing. Yeah, you put a dog in a real dog of a picture. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, he walked up the set. Yeah. Just, yeah. But it'd be funny if, like, the dog came on and you just, like, went to the bathroom, and then that's it. Right. He just leaves. <laughs> that's what I think about this thing. Just on the right. script. Because Elvis couldn't. So would you believe... That the nickname Satinin, which was the pet name for Scylla, but it came from Gladys. And it was based on how she used to say shortening, like shortening, shortening. In the song Mama's a Little Baby Like Shortening Bread, would you believe? That sounds believable. I'm going to believe it. Yeah, true-ish. Like, there are a couple different reasons, places they say that that came from. But that one, I saw it on more than one occasion that that was what that came from. So I'm calling it true-ish. So would you believe when they were casting the role of Elvis for this movie, one of the people on the shortlist was Harry Styles, who is the singer formerly of One Direction. Would you believe? Yeah, I mean, that guy's trying to do a lot of acting these days. Yes, I do believe that. No, that's false. But was in the running for the Baz Luhrmann Elvis role. So uh, there you go. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. There we go. All right. So coming up on my last one here. So sure. this is Priscilla based. You know, she wound up getting quite an acting career later on after her and Elvis separated. Would you believe that Francis Ford Coppola tried to cast Priscilla in the movie The Rainmaker? I think that came out in like 97, something like that. It would have been the role of the mother of the young man that passed away. Uh, I apologize for spoilers. I should have said spoiler oh. alert. <laughs> <laughs> But if you haven't seen it, you know, it's like a 25-year-old movie, so really it's on you. He was going to cast her in this role. I don't remember exactly the name of the character or anything, but the role went to uh, Mary Kay Place. Would you believe? I'm going to not believe that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's false. I made that up. However, Red West appears in that movie as that character's father. Oh, so, well, there you yeah, go. He's the husband... Anyway, so there you go. That's your what you believes. I think you got. Oh, I lost count. You did good. You did good, kid. Yeah, you did good. Yeah. Bye. I've got one for you. What's that? Go for it. I've got a would you believe for you. Okay. Um, I said earlier on the show that uh, Kaylee Spaney is the eighth actor to portray Priscilla Presley on screen. Okay. Which is a lot, really, all things considered. Absolutely. Far from the record of um, historical figures being depicted on screen. The record, would you believe, for most on-screen depictions of a historical figure is Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to not believe that, no. That's correct, that's correct. Uh, okay. It's not, he does not have the record. The record is actually held by Napoleon Bonaparte, who's been depicted really? on screen... Yes, 190 times he's been um, depicted on screen. Uh, 190 times? Yes. Holy crap. Wow. Uh, with one about to come out to theaters. Uh, you know, Ridley right. Scott's Napoleon. I've, I've seen the trailers. It looks like a fake movie to me. I don't believe this is real. He, uh, at 190, by far has the record. Uh, the next closest one is Jesus Christ, who's been depicted approximately 160 times. Wow. And third place is Abraham Lincoln. Oh, well, he's third. Okay, wow. That's still way up there. I wouldn't have really figured that because well, I guess these are all U.S. movies then, so I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I think I would have guessed Jesus. 
if you would ask me who was the most, I think I probably would have guessed Jesus. But I think it's interesting that both Napoleon and Lincoln get a hash mark from uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Pretty cool. Maybe it's the hat. You think it's Napoleon's hat? That's why he's in there. That's a very good question. I don't know. Maybe there's yeah. just a bunch of character actors who really look like the dude. Could be. Yeah, that's probably it. Just yeah. there's a lot of short people in Hollywood. Sure. So that's like really easy to cast him. Although I hear that's technically a lie. That he was just like kind of normal sized. And then right. somebody, a British person, just started a campaign to say he was like really tiny. So I had this idea. I'm going to throw it out here before we kind of wrap things up. The whole idea of Priscilla leaving and their marriage not working out. Do you think if the two of them had worked together when she had gotten a career as an actress, that that could have helped save the marriage? Do you think like those mm. two, like I think towards the end of his career, like 69-ish, he would have been like, hey, you know what? I want to do one more movie, me and Priscilla, and then I've, I have an idea for the movie. Yeah, hit me. Okay. So the remake, Love Me Tender... But Elvis plays the older brother that comes back. Then the Clint role, played by none other than David Cassidy. Uh, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah and sure. then Kathy, the Deborah Paget part, played by Priscilla. Hmm. And then he winds up with her at the end. And sure. here's the thing I don't think Elvis ever kissed Deborah Paget on screen. So it's a totally chase. I think they are they are in a bed briefly, but she gets out of the bed with him. So I think Elvis would have been above a board on all that and then winds up with her at the end. But then at the end, I think then they just have like a really steam, steamy sex scene. <laughs> <During the laughs> over over credits. the ghost, David Cassidy. <laughs> it's just the two of them just like just tearing into each other. <laughs> just doing the grown up. Yeah. Just a real like ma pedal y kind of guitar. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it's like that scene in um, Human Tornado where like the roof yeah. is caving in. <laughs> yeah. The lights are blinking on enough. Where it's no longer love me tender, but uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. But do you think sure. that could have saved their marriage? I think it could have. Possibly. I mean, it would have changed the dynamic a little bit. Kind of leveled the playing field. For sure. Absolutely. So before we wrap it up, I think two things we didn't get around to talking to is Larry Geller makes an appearance. Maybe his first on-screen depiction. Yeah, and probably definitely Mike Stones as well. Yes, yes. And uh, g gets a couple lines. Gets a couple lines, and they both do. And uh, unlike the Memphis Mafia, which we didn't get around to talking to because I think we kind of got sidetracked too many times, but that happens. But very cool that they're both in there. We didn't get around to talking to him too much, but maybe we'll just do like a second episode of this. Sure. You know, part two, and then we'll just talk about those two roles. <laughs> so we'll probably take a whole episode, like another hour. Yeah. Before we wrap it up, I think we should mention that if you have not checked out Elva's Book Club, our good friends, Pat and Brad, they do a great show. Go and check them out. They haven't put out an episode in a while, but, you know, fingers crossed it'll happen soon. Not only a great show, but those are also two guys that I can be sure listen to our show as well. Absolutely. So, so kudos, so guys, to your show. Shout out to those guys. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. And, you know, if you want to get in touch with us, you can always do that by emailing us at suspiciousmindspodcast77 at gmail.com. Or if that is just way too much for you to type, it's way too much for me to say, you could call and leave a message or text us if you're not into leaving messages or you don't like the sound of your own voice, something like that. You can do one of those at the Suspicious Minds hotline, which is 773-389-4276. And uh, how else can they find us on like the social media, Wade? Come check us out on Facebook at a Suspicious Minds Podcast with Wade and Burl. Trying to uh, stay as lively as possible on that dying format. What else we got here? We also are on Instagram as Suspicious Minds Podcast. A lot of stuff going on over there, mostly at this time announcing the latest episodes. But usually I'll throw some interesting photos. You know, the stuff about Elvis I like the most, mostly jumpsuit shots. A lot of cool stuff happening over there. So check that out, if you will. Just a couple more shout-outs for listeners that I know have supported us all season. My brother, Smoothie. Maybe we'll have him as a guest someday. Man, right. if you'd like to come on, more than glad to sure. have him. Yeah. Right. And also a shout out at the end of the season to um, longtime listener, Mark Longdon, good friend of mine, gruff but lovable. 
I know he's not a big Elvis fan, but he's a fan of the show. So we very much appreciate him stopping by. Yeah. And uh, wait, is that the guy that uh, said that I was handsome on uh, Facebook? Yeah. 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 So well, I got I to say, I got to say then, big fan. And also, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mark. It was a thank you yeah. for lying on Facebook for me. And also, I think this is a, one of the few things that I do that both of my parents listen to. So shout out to mom and dad. Uh, I very much appreciate you guys listening. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I don't know anybody I don't, that listens besides all the people you yeah. mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody will come forward in your life someday. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe then that'll happen. Know. Yeah, they're right. all in the shadows somewhere pretending not to listen. Right. Well, I think that wraps up the season. Once again, check the show description for the calendar if you want mm-hmm. to check that out. And here's the thing. Keep in mind, it's a leap year, so it's an extra added value. So you get an extra day of calendar. Oh, there you go. Man, pretty nice. Pretty good things. But, For the um, same cost of as a uh, regular calendar. Yeah, we didn't up the price day. at all. We just kept it the exact yeah. same. You get a whole extra day. So really, we're passing along the savings to you. Great finishing up a whole other season with you. Can you believe it? Yeah, I can't believe it. Uh, looking very much forward to season three. We've got a lot of cool stuff on deck. I know we're going to do... Um, do we really? Uh, we don't even know. <laughs> I know for sure we're going to cover Jailhouse Rock. The, That's the for sure. Yep. That's, that's definitely happening in the next season. Well, yeah, once again, thanks to all of our listeners listening. And we'll be back, you know, in a few short months, hopefully. And sure. uh, as soon as we can, as soon as we get it together and record more of these, we'll get them out to you. So check out that Priscilla movie. It would definitely yeah. worth it. Cool. We'll catch you next season. Yeah. Uh, word to your mother. <laughs>